Hi everybody, John Bruin, Chief Exec. Thanks for joining us today for the um, latest Ask the Exec update. Um, with me in um, the Tony Footit room is um, Anne-Marie Newham, our Director of Nursing, AHPs and Quality, and Alison Wilde, Interim Director of Finance. Um, I just thought I'd start by giving just a couple of sort of headlines as to where we are. Then um, please do join in and ask questions, comments, views, or welcome. And um, excuse me from time to time, I might need to take a mask off to have a sip of coffee. I had permission from the Director of Nursing um, to be able to do that. So you'll all have seen, I'm sure, the very good news this morning around the vaccine approval um, for the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine has been signed off by the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulations Agency. Um, and I think that's going to be, well, it's a pretty obvious thing to say, but you know, it's a real pivot point in, in the, the challenge of managing the pandemic. And it's really good news. We're hoping to receive the first batch of that sometime next week. Um, I think there's something like, is it like 800,000 deliveries into the into the UK? And obviously that's going to be divvied up by region and then divvied up within region and then sent to us. So it's going to be dribs and dribs. vaccines been submitted, evidence has been submitted to the MHRA will follow in quick succession. So I think by the end of December, um, we'll start to be receiving quite significant numbers of vaccines. And certainly the first two, you, you'll be up to speed on the challenge around the logistics, the, the requirement for ultra low temperatures, um, and the challenge of, of getting that um, across large geographies. So there's huge logistics operation, um, both nationally and within our county to get that set up. The first prioritisation batch will be um, for health and social care staff. And again, we're currently working up how that will work. So really good news. And um, I think that'll, that'll be the start of um, a very significant change to how we're managing in the pandemic. Um, the other main piece to just to update you on is around um, mass testing for staff. So you'll be hopefully be aware that we received um, truckloads of what are called lateral flow test kits at the end of last week, and we started to distribute those again across the organisation. Again, a massive logistics exercise. These are um, coming to a, a team near you over the next couple of weeks. It will take some time to roll them out. Um, and it's really important to state at the moment, we haven't been supplied with enough to cover everybody. So we're working with the regional and national team to request more, but we're on the receiving end of what gets delivered. Um, so it's not as though we, we've been slow at distribution. Um, the, again, the, I think they're a really important stage in how we start to adapt to the to the um, the environment we're in, because it, it gives a, a, a lot more power to um, into the hands of staff about how to manage. So staff will receive a kit that, which will last, I think, about twelve weeks, two tests a week relatively easy to administer, get a result within 20 to 30 minutes. And we've just heard this morning in the exec team the the, um, the technology in terms of loading that up um, into results and getting information about what to do about it if it's not negative. Um, it's a relatively easy uh, click on through connect, upload your result, and there's all sorts of um, inputs, support staff on that. So again, that'll put us in a really strong position and knowing um, one's COVID status um, and a, a real pivotal point in, in how, how we manage across the organisation. So 
they're the two sort of big headlines. And I think over the next couple of weeks, in amongst all the other stuff that we're managing on a day-to-day basis, like managing services, looking after patients, will be at the forefront of our, our challenges. So um, great place to be, lots to do. Oh, and yes, we're also moving into Christmas. So ordinarily we'd be planning our secret Santas and getting the trees up and starting to enjoy ourselves a bit and appreciate that it's, it's going to be very different this year. So the, just to finish from my sort of introductory remarks is a, again a massive thank you to everybody out there that's keeping the show on the road. We do appreciate it's tough. The environments that people are working in are really difficult um, and we could all do with a bit of um, easing up of the lockdown. Um, I think the majority of us will have overnight gone from lockdown to tier three if not tier two and there's still very significant restrictions so I hope um, the news about the testing and certainly the the the, the vaccines coming online is, is a bit of light at the end of the tunnel that's a little bit nearer. So that's um, me done in terms of introductory remarks. Um, happy to uh, take questions, comments, and I'm going to look to Alex to see if we've got anything coming in. And um, as I say, um, please add any questions or put your hands up if you want to ask a question. Uh, we have had some sent in, so I'll just go through those now. Um, so as you said, John, the, the testing kits are being rolled out across the organisation. Based on um, other um, what's happened previously in other trusts, have you got an expected impact of what this would mean for staffing numbers? You take that, Amaria. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Amaria will take that one. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, Amaria here. So yes, with regards to lateral flow testing, um, the experience that we've managed to gain from other trusts that have already been doing it, there's that there's a loss of about one to two percent of staff that um, test positive um, because um, they may well have had it um, and been asymptomatic, not know that they've got it or they could have had it for a couple of months and are still testing positive. So that's the experience from other trusts is that we'll lose approximately one to two percent of staff that will test positive and then we'll need to self-isolate for the um, for the 14 days. The other thing just to, to bear in mind is that if you um, are part of the program for lateral flow testing, if you're part of that, you will test twice a week, first thing in the morning, and you will record it. So some of, some of you have already started doing that, which is absolutely fantastic. We've already got some centres that are inputting their results into the app that we have, and that's absolutely brilliant. People are doing a brilliant job with that. But what we know is, is that if you get a positive lateral flow test, then you need to go and have a PCR test, which is the swab, which is the full swab. Because what we do know is that the lateral flow testing isn't quite as accurate as the PCR. So it's almost a double check. If you come up positive on the lateral flow, you just then need to go and have um, a swab done through the PCR. And that's through our system still as well. So we will still... Um, uh, we will still sort all of that out for you. That's not something you've got to go away and do. We just book that through on our system as well. Is that, um, hopefully that's answered what people wanted. It's about one to 2% we think we'll, we'll lose uh, staff that'll need to self-isolate. Yeah, and, and obviously the benefit of that is that we um, can now identify people that will have been asymptomatic and possibly spreading um, the virus across the organisation. I've got a question for you, Anne-Marie. Why, why aren't you on the screen? I can see myself down the bottom. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. I can see myself. <laughs> it depends when people have joined the, the call site. So. I thought when I talk, people would see me. Can people see me when I talk? No. Oh, sorry. I'm talking... Oh look, Mark, I can see Mark Howe's giving it no. <laughs> I can see you, Mark. Do you have a camera on? It's, yeah, I've got my camera on. Yeah, I think it, it, it depends. Some people will be able to see different people on the screen. I've got a fabulous background as well that I'd like to have shown you all, but hey. <laughs> but when it's recorded, then the, the um, sorry, when it's when it's uploaded, I don't think it's so Oh, I see. Ah, there we go, Anne-Marie. Oh, right. Are you spotlighted? Somebody's in. Yay. 
Yeah, I've got good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got, got good, good background. Yes. Right. What's question? And what's the next question, Alex? Um, I've got a question here from Jenny, who's asked, "How will the trust be disseminating the info from mass testing?" Um, yeah. Go on. yeah. Well, um, do you mean as in how the information, as in how to how to self test, or the information about how many people are coming out positive? Let me answer. Let, let me answer a few of those. With regards to the mass testing, we've got um, we we recruit about. 9,500 staff in this organisation and we've got approximately 6,000 um, lateral flow testing kits and they're being disseminated out to staff at the moment. There is a meeting at half past eight every single day that talks about lateral flow testing and the vaccine, COVID vaccine, and all the logistics are done through that meeting. In each of the divisions, we have got champions that understand and know what's happening with regards to the dissemination of the lateral flow kits. So at the moment, the information is coming through John's daily briefs. So anything that we feel is important for anybody out there to understand and know, that goes in John's daily brief. And we also have information that comes out through something called the um, ICT, which is the Incident Control Team. So information comes out through that as well. But we will use all social media to ensure that we get all of the comms out around what we're doing around testing. And, uh, and Jenny, if that hasn't answered your question, just come back to us and yeah. uh, let us know. Um, just uh, another question related to the vaccine. Are there any known side effects with the COVID vaccine? So the information that we've had um, on the pilots, because as you know, thousands of people have received the vaccine as part of a pilot and part of um, understanding the efficacy and how it works. So we do know from national nationally that at the moment, People are saying that there aren't any side effects, but it's very similar to when you've had your flu uh, jab, that you do get a little bit of kind of like achy arm for a few days afterwards. But nobody is saying that there's anything else at the moment. Neil's just asked a question. Do we know how many staff have tested positive or have COVID? And of those, have we reported any as work related? So, Neil, we do know. If staff go through our own uh, testing platform, which is through Sherwood, we, we absolutely do know the numbers, we know who's tested positive. We know that from beginning of um, September, when the first outbreaks occurred in wave two, we've recorded all of that centrally in the incident control team. So they've got a record of everybody that's tested positive. We've got a big long spreadsheet and it says whether or not people have tested positive, but they've also been tested and are negative as well. So we do know all of that. At the moment, people are inputting, if they're doing the lateral flow testing, then they are inputting into the app and we have all of that knowledge about who's tested positive and who tested negative. So the next part of the question was, uh, and of those we've recorded, any work related? We don't necessarily know if it's work related, um, in as much as I'm, I'm assuming you mean that have they have they caught it at work when we have a COVID outbreak meeting, which I chair at 4 p.m. every single day, we do dig into how potentially patients or staff have caught uh, the virus at that point. And it may be something that's happened in the ward. It could be something that's happened that people haven't been aware of. For example, if a mask has been pulled down in restraint or a photocopy has been used and not clean after, cleaned after use. So we do know that there's some transference in different places. But at the moment, we're not always necessarily able to say whether or not it's work related. Sometimes it's from the community and the, patient, the, uh, the patients have been out in the community or they've had leave or staff have gone from home into work. But the lateral flow testing is going to give us so much more knowledge. It's going to give us so much more understanding of who has it, who's asymptomatic, and where potentially we need to self-isolate. I just emphasise that, and that's why um, we keep banging on about um, using PPE. 
correctly and we know it's a it's a oh i know what neil's asking now come back yeah so and it's a real challenge but um you know until we can get other other ways to protect us it, it's what we've got to do and um that, that it's a big issue isn't it that, that you can be up to five days where you are contagious but without symptoms and therefore it's, it can be difficult as Amory has said to know where people have contracted the infection from because there's a there's a big there's a big window of opportunity as it were do you want to come back on yeah that? so i can see what neil, so neil's asking whether or not we've riddle reported uh, we've discussed riddle reporting of um staff um that have become positive um and neil what what we've also done is we've made sure that there's a real clear process in place because there will be the odd occasion that staff will catch um COVID whilst at work due to something that they've not been able to do themselves, for example, in a restraint or an incident. So we do have a process and we do we do acknowledge that we may need to riddle report if somebody um, is infected and needs time off. So we do know that. And then the next question, do we turn to the next question? At the moment, um, What's the next Dr. Kayla is asking whether or not the vaccine is fully operational and rolled out enough to cover all not staff. Will staff be mandated to have one? So we have had this conversation and it is not mandated. Yeah, it's, it's really important to emphasise that. So um, the, I, I think it goes back to the in that there's a policy about um, vaccines and related that goes back i think to the 1980s that we that we work these as a um it's advisory um it's recommended it's part of your professional responsibilities but it's really important to stress as with the flu vaccines they're not mandated and um, it's not how um, things are done and we'd like to um, you know make the arguments of the re all the reasons the, the the positive benefits for both individuals protecting our staff and our teams, but also patients, that it's the right thing to do. However, um, as Anne-Marie has said, it, it's, it's not going to be mandated. Uh, and, that, um, and that's the, the national position too. Do you want me to take the next one from yeah. Jenny? Yeah. So Jenny's asked, what is the guidance for self-isolation and people who are asymptomatic? So it, it hasn't changed uh, from what we've been saying all along is from the moment of testing positive, you self-isolate for the 14 days, or if you, or from the moment you are poorly, that's the public health guidance. So Public Health England have given us guidance that you record it from the date, date and day that you were either positive on your test or from the first day you became poorly. So it stays the same. You need to self-isolate as soon as you've had a positive PCR test. You need to self-isolate for the 14 days. If you've already got um, COVID and you've, you're symptomatic, you've got one of the symptoms that they're talking about, then it's 10 days. And the reason being for that is what uh, Dr. Bruin has said is because you are already incubating it for several days. Um, we've got another question just about um, how are the vaccine and testing sites uh, going to be staffed? Um, I can start that if you want. Yeah, go for it. There's been a, a whole stack of work behind the scenes in setting up um, both the regional and the, the county-wide vaccine centres and there's going to be a, a sort of mixed offer in terms of mass vaccination sites that are being worked up um, in Mansfield and in Nottingham. There's going to be um, the sort of staff specific hospital sites. There's going to be roving sites for people that um, either in care homes or housebound. Um, and there's going to be sites hosted by general practices in their um, primary care networks. Um, in terms of staffing them, we've we've asked all organisations across um, the county, both providers, the CCG, primary care, to um, uh, ask volunteers to 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 staff them from uh, medical supervision for from admin 
estates, IT, etc., um, as well as um, getting a whole load of vaccinators, which is a, a newly described um, activity. There's a live advert on um, NHS jobs to apply to become a vaccinator. You, um, Sherwood Forest Hospitals are hosting the employment of this. Um, and it enables people to do this in addition to other work. Um, you can you can log on to the link. Um, and at the minute, we've been not inundated, but we we've had literally hundreds of people really sort of up for this. Um, it's been really positively received. Um, there are some pinch points about some of the more um, supervisory roles in in running all the centres, but at the moment that we're on track in terms of being ready. We, we were mandated to be ready yesterday for the first vaccines to arrive by the 9th of December. And those two dates have been in the diary for a number of weeks now. So the actual timeline is, is pretty spot on. Does that cover that? It does. Kumar's asked you another question, though. Kumar's asked, are we having any vaccine centres in Leicester? Uh, would help Arnold Large IAP to defend the health staff at Leicester? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Kumar. Thanks for that question. I think that's in in the um, in the box of um, to be worked out, and um, there will obviously be um, vaccine centres in Leicester set up by the Leicester and Leicestershire system. In terms of what works best for our staff and patients to access a vaccine, um, I don't think we've got down to that level of detail yet, which generally people might. I think that's quite surprising, but we are doing this almost on a on a day to day basis. And the um, just for example, this morning we've just been talking around um, the, the 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 legal documents that back up the finance, the employment, the the quality assurance stuff. So it's it's a rapidly changing piece. But I'll, I'll make a note of that so that we can when we do know we can get some um, intel to you um, in Leicester as soon as possible. Um, we've had another um, a question which is um, linked very much to something you've already said, John, but um, how are we linking in with the acute trusts and other NHS organisations to support with the fight against COVID? Yeah, so uh, uh, we've got daily calls. We, um, as a, and this is being managed nationally through the ICS or STP network, so the Integrated Care Systems the STPs, which are largely county-based conglomerates of NHS and social care organisations, and all the coordination is, is in Nottinghamshire is done through the ICS. I know that doesn't cover all our patches, but um, but other counties have a similar mechanism. Within each of those, there's a lead or coordinate coordinating organisation for Nottinghamshire. That's us. Um, there are joint um, senior responsible officers, so that's myself and the chief exec of University Hospitals, Tracy Taylor, um, and all the teams that, whether uh, as I've alluded to, that whether it's the logistics, the facilities, the estate, um, the staffing, um, that those lead roles are spread right across all the different organisations. So it's actually been a really good example of um, collaborative working, mutual support, sharing expertise. Um, for example, Shield Forest are doing the, the employment hosting and sorting out of the bank, um, whereas we may be, for example, leading on some of the contracting arrangements and the money. Um, That's great. I get it? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Alison, I don't know if you want to answer this. Um, yeah. You seem to be making a lot of changes with regards to colleagues being able to work at home. Um, is this something we will be able to do when the COVID crisis is over? Um, the short answer is is yes. I hope so. Um, as we move, I don't think any of us could have expected the longevity, longevity of COVID and the working at home. And I think we are introducing some um, measures now to provide desks and make sure everybody's safe working at home. I think what we need to do as an organisation is work on the principles of home working and that's that piece of work started already. 
Um, I think there will be a mixed system across the trust. There will be people and our clinical teams who, who have to come into work, do the job. There'll be a mix of people that can do both and there'll be a mix of people that will could work at home more than others. Um, and we need to make sure we've got that infrastructure in there to support it. Um, for, for us, though, as an exec team, I think there's a fundamental principle that we need to actually remain uh, connected to the organisation and connected to our teams individually so that teams aren't lost in, in this and that we're not working at home and isolated from the rest of the organisation and teams. We're looking at the home working policy now um, and we, we need to link all that to our trust values and we're hoping that'll be a co-production across teams at the moment. And um, I think our HR colleagues are leading on that. So our senior leadership team are drawing up this home working. We'll be asking for imp input across the organisation for that. But absolutely fundamental is that we need to be connected to the organisation wherever we're working. Um, I think that answers yeah. that. I don't know if anybody's got anything yeah, to I, add. I just emphasise those points that Alison's made. There's some almost some fundamental changes that the, the pandemic has shown, uh, sort of precipitated, isn't it, really, in terms of um, whether, as we saw the other day, that the, 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 there's complete change to how the high street's going to work. Um, I think the the advent of MS Teams and related technology as as is transformative in the in the way that we work, not just in terms of from a corporate or enabling function, but in terms of some of our clinical practice. And I think um, when as a as a sort of leading organisation that's on the front foot and agile and adaptive as we evolve, this is a really good example of one of the things that we we have to do some really good co-productive co-production engagement work uh, across all our staff groups to get the best model for how. We facilitate um, working from home um, and, and a blended model that enables people to be the best they can. Um, so we'll all have views, and I know that there's, there's lots of views that we that we do come across quite rightly. But our task is to make sure that we that we can design a model that is is fit for the post-pandemic age, if you like. Mm -hmm. If I can just add as well, I think um, there's an important piece of work that's been carried out by our estates team in terms of our Litchfield Lane base at Mansfield, where that's the first base in the trust that will become a true hot desking area and new ways of working that we're at consultation on at the moment with individuals who are working there. And we're hoping that that will be rolled out further should we, once we've tested that. And that should be going live on the 16th of December, which is a pure hot desking area, um, very different to what we're used to and a big change for us as a trust, but a test for us to look at how it works and roll that out going forward. Mm -hmm. um, just if I can, um, I was just asking another question, Alison. Just, yep. um, we've had a question, um, have we had any money from the Captain Tom Fund? Um, and if so, what are we doing with it? Absolutely. Yes, we have had some money from the Captain Tom Fund and um, some comms are about to come out this week, actually. Um, as an organisation, we set up um, a Captain Tom's committee. We had £95,000. So we put a committee together um, in August and asked for ideas across the organisation um, of of what it could be spent on. We had some really fantastic ideas through, um, some very specific ones and a, a good response. And it would have been really nice to be able to say yes to all of them. In fact, we did say yes to some of them and that they needed to be sorted out in the divisions. But what we did decide as a, as a trust was that we wanted to, to get to as many staff and patients as we possibly could. Um, so we wanted the most people to, to benefit from that. Um, so what was actually decided is that the wellbeing packages for frontline staff would be funded from um, from the Tech Captain Tom's Fund. We're also looking at, um, we've decided to do Captain Tom walks on a number of the trust sites with com some commemorative benches to Captain Tom. And they'll be supported by a digital guide highlighting the different lengths of walks. Um, so something really, really health and well-being led um, and Tracy Orland has been working on that. 
The third thing that we, we, we're looking at, or we are actually doing, is putting tablets on all wards to support digital inclusion. So during the COVID um, and, and patients not being able to see friends and family, they will have access to video call relatives and friends if they can't have those, those important visits. So we're now bringing all the details of that together. Um, and um, there was some information coming out. I say the comms are coming out generally this week and we'll send some more details out of, of the individual schemes. There is a phase two of Captain Tom's money, which is being um, led by our colleagues in Nottingham University hospitals that we can bid for, which is about our wider community and how we, um, how we can help the wider community and give some grants out in that area. So we will be looking for suggestions across the organisation that we could do that. Um, so the more to follow on stage two of that, but we're working on that. That's great. Thank you. Um, before we move on to the Christmas related questions that we've had, um, um, Catherine's asking, when COVID is over and we get back to normality, what is the plan around developing the trust strategy and priorities moving forward? That's a really great question, Catherine. Um, we, we, we are, of course, trying to make sure that we and continue with some of the sort of day job, if you like, and that we don't talk about COVID and vaccines all the time. And um, you hopefully be aware that we are in the middle of um, re re reviewing our uh, longer term strategy as, as, a, as an organisation. Um, and I, I'd, I'd really like to, um, to see us um, move forward from some of the really good progress we've made over the last couple of years. So, for example, the um, the return rate on the National Staff Survey, we just had the final figures today, was um, over 53%. And that's an increase of over 14% in the last two years. Um, and for me, that's a real signal that we're starting to um, engage much more with um, you know, the fantastic staff we've got across all our divisions um, the expertise that we have um, and it, this is an opportune time now for us to to really reset our strategy to um, to, to begin to artic articulate what we actually mean by being one of the best providers of mental health care learned disability care community care forensic care um, in not you know not just in the in the in the region but why not in the country and um, why not really start to uh, realize that ambition um, and enable our staff to be, um, you know, as good as they want to be. Um, and some of the work we've done around culture and values and the behavioural stuff, the, the, the just and restorative cultures is critically important. Pandemic has, in, on the one hand, gotten away a bit, but on the other hand, it, it's, been a, it's been a really powerful identifier, hasn't it, for some of, the, some of the issues that we need to look at more closely. I'm really optimistic that we're getting into a place now where we can really start to drive um, our strategy forward and have a plan that we can work off to start to go up charts, as it were. I don't know if Amory, do you want to say anything more about that? No, no that's enough. <laughs> um, we just had a question from um, Kumar. I don't know if you want to answer that, Alison. Um, one of the trusts in South West has given one day extra annual leave for staff as they worked hard during COVID period. Uh, would, would it be good for our board to consider this? It can make a big difference to our staff morale. Uh, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for that question, Kumar. I think it's something we discussed quite um, in detail at our exec leadership team because we did want to recognise um, the staff efforts during COVID. Um, it, we did consider this, but we've got a balance in terms of delivering the services. Um, we've also got um, staff that haven't been able to take the annual leave this year. That's, that, that is obviously a health and wellbeing issue and a service continuity about how and when they've got the ability to take that. I think after consideration, we decided to go down a different route to recognise staff um, um, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say I'm looking at John to say what that is yet. <laughs> well, I think it's, a, it's a watch this space because it's, it's, it's a really important point that Kumar raises. Um, and as you said, Alison, the, the annual leave is fraught with all sorts of um, technical issues. Uh, and that's not to 
sort of weasel out of, of giving it because if it was if it was straightforward and we could um i think it's it's a really good thing but we're we're just finalizing um a package that we hope will go some way to recognize the fantastic work that's, that, that staff are doing and um, but we're not quite at the point where we can announce yet so Perhaps if I can just give you a bit of a teaser that there's, there's something coming very soon <laughs> um, that hopefully will be um, that will be welcomed right across the organisation. Can I, I? I'll just I'll just add in something. So Kumar, you're absolutely right. We did um, debate it at length, um, but we have to remember that whatever we do costs a lot of money, and um, even down to. Um, what we've, we've looked at what all the other trusts are doing around us because you know we, we do we are aware we do know we can see people do tell us they tell us on facebook as well that such and such trust is doing this and such and such trust is doing that but even a small thing can cost around two hundred thousand uh, pounds for us to do and that is still public money so we have to be really wise with what we do and make sure that it meets everybody's needs and that it does recognize and we do value what everybody's put in because people have gone over and above over these last six months so i just wanted to say is that we do know but it is the balance it's the balance of what we're spending against you know the the reward and i know that it's not enough for us just to say thank you we realize that we know that but also i've just put on there is that from the first of december there's care packages that have gone out these care packages are boxes that contain um chocolates treats hand creams um lip bar you name it it's all in there hot chocolate coffees teas so these care packages have gone out to teams and they have cost some considerable amount of money as well so they've gone out to clinical teams to acknowledge the fabulous work that they're all doing out there as well so as well as those care packages um and also, um, I do know that um, facilities have also done some other bits and pieces as well for staff in, in as much as getting water sent out, bottles of water and other things and refreshments. What John's been talking about will also happen. So we have done quite a few stages. We might not have advertised it as well as everybody else has, but we have absolutely done some bits and pieces and some more stuff will come out. Um, Jonathan um, Saxon has asked. Um, some question, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, do you want me to so, John, so Jonathan's <laughs> question is the NHS Scotland has given no, the NHS sorry. each member a five hundred pound bonus. Do you think NHS England will also do this um, for frontline care staff? I think that the answer is no, it won't. Mm. Um, whatever your politics and whatever you think about, um, you know where we are with England and Scotland and the union. Um, the, the, there's a, there's a lot of politic, capital P politics behind this, um, and uh, I'm. My view is that I don't think NHS England will. Um, I'm just working it out. If there's about a million people working in the NHS in England, um, that's half a billion quid. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's just about the money. Um, so sorry to disappoint. And, and if we do get one, then <laughs> it'll be a pleasant surprise. Um, just looking at Mark's comment in terms of uh, mm. the others that aren't clinical staff, absolutely, Mark, a good point, really. It's not just about clinical staff. It is about all the corporate and support services that are enabling all this to happen as well. So absolutely a big thank you to everybody trust-wide, not, ju not just the clinical teams that are battling on through COVID. Good point. Good point. I agree. Yeah. Um, so just before we... Um, we asked Anne Maria about her Christmas list. I was just, I was, um, just wondering. You're all if... dying to know, I know. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep that tension. But are there any other specific updates that you'd like to give us? Anything, for example, Tracy mentioned about? Yeah, she did, yeah. Um, so I never miss an opportunity to talk about flu. Um, so I just wanted to let you know we're, we're off the naughty step, step at the very, very bottom. However, we're still in the red zone. And I know that all of you are doing a fabulous, fabulous job out there to make sure that as many people are vaccinated as possible. And remember, it's not about um, you needing to have a flu vaccine for individual reasons. It's for a whole host of reasons. It's about, it's about making sure that your patients are safe, your loved ones are safe, your families are safe, your peers are safe. So please, please, please uh, make sure that you book in, go and have your flu. They're doing lots and lots of drop-in clinics now, drop-in and mop-up clinics. 
So um, you don't necessarily always have to book. You might be able to find somebody who's just doing a drop-in clinic. And if you cannot access a flu clinic for any reason whatsoever, contact us and we will make sure that we come out and get, get hold of you. And we'll come to you if we need to. One more thing is that I've realised that lots and lots of people have had the flu jab, but have not necessarily had it with the trust. So can you just make sure that you let us know or fill the form out, which is on Connect. But either way, either fill the form out, just let us know, and then we can record it so we don't keep pestering you. In the league table, not that I'm that competitive, we are above two of our closest <laughs> rivals. But that's I thought I was competitive. That means, that means there's more about how poorly generally mental health and community trust Absolutely. compared to, to acute. So although there is one mental health trust that's um, pretty near the top of the charts, darn. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, appreciate the challenge, but also um, appreciate the hard work that everyone's putting into this. It's, um, it's important for lots of reasons, but um, it would be good to get out of the red zone. Um, and so Jenny Newman has asked, um, we're putting together a Not HC Christmas playlist. Which top tunes would you like to see on it? And I happen to know that the reason for asking that is because we've got the thank you event on the 15th of December. And um, so it's linked to that. So just a bit of a plug for that as well. Um, but so, what, what would be your favourite Christmas tunes? Well, start with Alison. <laughs> I'm a bit of a humble with Christmas tunes. Oh, <laughs> Fairy Tale of New York. That's probably one of my favourites. It's been banned. Pokes. <laughs> Has it? <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm not politically correct. <laughs> um, so um, my, I've got a, um, it's an embarrassing favourite one because um, <laughs> I was never into board bands, but one of my favourite Christmas songs is East 17, Stay. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's got a soft side, after all. Um, that, that's completely blown all my street credibility. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> my, my other, my other favourite is uh, it's not recognised particularly, but uh, I think as a Christmas song, but it's Barclay James Harvest, and it's called Him, as in singing a hymn. Um, Look that up on YouTube. It's from a very, very long time ago. <laughs> Maria. I don't really have one. I, I love all. I do love all Christmas tunes, and I love all the old ones like Wizard and you know, here it is, Merry Christmas and all that. So I, I couldn't name them, but I just love them. <laughs> Excellent. Um, just very quickly moving back to flu. Mary yeah. has asked on the point of flu. There is a lot of people that may not have. I know, I know exactly what this misinformed, is. may not have had the vaccine um, as it misinformed or don't know huge about it. Yeah, so Mary, I, I know what you're related to. So what we did is we put on um, we put on the closed Facebook page, why, why have staff not had the jam? <laughs> and it's um, revealed quite a lot about our staff, about how they feel about the jab. So I would say that a good 30% have said there's no way that they would ever touch it again. It gave them flu, it gave, made them poorly, they felt that their arm was like numb for days. Um, I have to say, um, I respect all of that and I recognise that people are afraid to have it because they think they're going to be poorly or they have been poorly in the past. Honestly, honestly, the flu jab is extremely safe. It is not a live vaccine and yes, your, your arm will be numb for a couple of days afterwards. My arm was numb for a couple of days afterwards. So you always make sure you use the arm that you're not writing with. So make sure it's either your left arm or your right arm, whichever one you don't predominantly write with. Um, so we do need to do some comms because it was very interesting to see what people had said and how they felt um, afterwards and what they thought had happened to them. So we do need to put some comms out. And I can see that Tracy has put something down to say that we will do some additional comms, but it is extremely safe. And I do recognise that for some people, they still feel it's not, and, and, and that's fine. And I can't say anything about that. But I'm saying to you is that the flu vaccine is safe. Thank you. And Suzanne um, added in um, that there is a flu myths buster info sheet on Connect. Um, so she will get that sent out as, as well. Excellent. Um, we haven't had any other questions. So, um, and Maria. The only thing Neil has said is perhaps you could offer a prize for a reward for having the flu jab. Um, we did consider that actually 
Neil, and it's quite an interesting aspect. So I do know that quite a few trusts do offer a prize draw. Um, and we have put in that um, some of the peer vaccinators, we're going to put them into a draw because they're doing this over and above their day job. A lot of the um, peer vaccinators <laughs> done it over and above. So we have done that, but I think I think it's definitely worth us thinking about doing that. And if we haven't, if we haven't got time to do it this year, absolutely we will do it for next year. So thank you, thank you so much for that. Any other questions that we haven't covered? That you think we draw things to a close? Speak up now or wait till next week? It's uh, it's just the one that you asked, John. So Anne Maria, is there anything on your Christmas <laughs> list in particular? <laughs> <laughs> oh no don't ask me stuff like that Shall I say, I, uh, mine is i'd like the covid vaccine that's one and um and number two um i'd like to see my dad <laughs> he's 84 he was 84 last uh, friday and um and i'd just like to spend some time with him because he's very lonely and on his own <laughs> that's it very good thank you is that it yeah thanks ever so much everybody that's a, a really good session thank you for your inputs thank you for your questions um, tell your friends and um, tell your colleagues um, because we're going to be doing this on a weekly basis um, so that we can you know, reach out and just it's really important that we can feel that um, you know what it's like out there. Have a good day and I'll see you next week. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.